So hello, my name is Karen Noel. I'm a senior director at Red Hat and my partner here. Hi, uh, my name is Eric Dune. Uh, pronouns are he, him, his. And I am a software engineering manager also at Red Hat. Okay, so today we're gonna talk about English language and open source inclusion. So the agenda slide. So um, we're gonna talk about native English and English as a second language speakers as a type of diversity. So we did a survey, we're gonna tell you the demographics, who answered, what the results were, and some key insights that we got from their comments. And then finally, we're gonna talk about recommendations that everybody has for English as a second language spe speakers, but also us native English speakers to help be allies for these folks. So the first section is about English, about open source, about diversity. So um, I like to say that diversity is a fact and, a, and actually a really good thing in open source communities. We really want representation from a lot of different types of diversity, a wide variety of levels, all types of, types of diversity. So I put some definitions up here of DEIB in case you're not familiar with those terms and how I define them. But if you think about it, open source, open, and communities, I mean, we were really into equity, inclusion, feeling accepted and supported, and those are all keys to success in open source communities. Um, and we're defining for this talk today diversity as if you're a native uh, English speaker or if English as a second language. So what I'd like to know from all you guys is um, if English is your first language, raise your hand. And if your English is not your first language, raise your hand. Okay, so mostly native English speakers, which is great because you're, you're the ally group. Okay, so why English? <laughs> I think it should be obvious to everybody, but I'll go over it really quickly. Um, throughout history of software, Programming, you know, English has been embedded in the languages. Uh, there's English words all over the place, like if, then, else, do, while, variable, function. Um, not just in the programming language itself, but in the code comments, in the commit messages, copyright notices, codes of conduct. They're all in English. You have to understand English, really, to be a software, software programmer. And in fact, you can make big mistakes in open source communities by um, badly named variables or unclear comments. It can add a lot of back and forth to the, to the discussion. Uh, secondly, all the major conferences in open source are in English, like this one. You know, everything is in English. Um, there are some regional local conferences that will be in the local language, and those are great. And then there's things in between where you may have a conference that is in a different language, say Chinese, and then they'll want to attract an international audience. So they'll have some English speakers come in and they'll um, have some of the talks in English and you can see that on the program. So I have personal experience here. I went to LinuxCon 2018 in Beijing and it was really interesting because um, we looked for talks that were in English so we could attend and understand. And one particular talk, I was sitting there with a colleague and the speaker started speaking in Chinese. So I raised my hand and I said, wait, I thought this was, it says in the program it's in English. He says, well, I looked at the audience and most, it's, most of the audience is Chinese, so I'm just going to do it in Chinese. And instead of being offended, we sat there, listened to it in Chinese, but we could read the slides because the slides were all in English. And the other interesting thing was, a lot of the words he, were use, he's, was, he was using were English words because he's talking about programming. Okay, so let's talk about the survey that we did. Okay, so uh, we both work in a group in Red Hat called Core Platforms. And Core Platforms is um, Fedora, CentOS, uh, Lit, uh, RHEL, OpenStack, Satellite, Insights, so it encompasses more than RHEL, more than just Linux. Um, <clears throat> so we ran the survey for just over a week. Um, 
it was just a couple weeks ago, in the middle of the summer, middle of vacation season. We ran it over a week, so we wanted to run it over a weekend and catch those folks in Israel who work on Sunday. Um, we were really pleased that we got 427 uh, people to respond to the survey, which was just about 21%. We thought that was pretty good. Um, we had several comments, people e emailing us about how important this topic is to them. So we were really happy about that. So let's see, we had about 36% of those who answered the survey were native English speakers. We expected a lot more. Um, si about 64% are English second language speakers. Now I'm not sure if this represents all of core platforms percentage-wise. I think the survey was just a little bit more interesting to the English second language speakers. So not sure about that. Okay, we also asked people what country they live in. And this was really interesting. So just about the same percentage of US and Chechia people responded. And those were by, by far like over half of the people were those two countries. Um, and then there were a whole bunch of other countries between 1% and 10% and a really long tail of people under 1% uh, countries. I also asked people what country they were born in because I wanted to see how many people don't live in the same country that they were born in. And those numbers are really interesting. About 26% of people live in a different country than they were born in. And this is core platforms. This is just the people that answered the survey. But I wonder, you know, is this common in open source? OK, so one of the first questions, how often do you modify your written or oral verbal communication style to accommodate uh, ESL speakers? So this was the answers from the native English speakers. Um, so what was interesting is <laughs> once the survey went out, we, also, we got comments from people saying that this question was not clear to them. And these were the English second language speakers. So our survey wasn't perfect at first, but we did modify some of the questions to make them clearer. And I thought that was really interesting to learn what is unclear to some people. So what's cool about this um, for the native English speakers, over 90% of the respondents had a positive response, meaning they modified their language either most of the time or sometimes. That was far higher than I expected. So Eric, do you want to talk about some of the comments? So in addition to just asking if, they, um, if English speakers modify their, their uh, communication style, um, we also asked what are the things that they do. As you can see, it's some of the, the bubbles. Those are uh, some of the comments that they shared. Uh, a, few, a few key things I want to pull out is uh, interruptions. So if an English as a second language speaker is hesitant to speak in the first place, Contending with interruptions is obviously going to make them more hesitant. Filler words. So, for example, what you don't want to do is like, um, you know, add filler words that um, might not add a lot of value to like the conversation because it adds an extra uh, mental load on folks. And, um, just to be clear, that was probably more painful for me to say than for you folks to hear. <laughs> but if you get my point about filler words, they don't add much to the conversation. And it's something that folks are just constantly having to interpret and, and translate. Jokes and cultural or country specific phrases, those may not translate well. Uh, they get lost in translation. Uh, so these are some of the things that uh, English native English speakers are conscious of when speaking to ESL folks. OK, the next question is we turned it around and we asked those um, ESL speakers, do you modify your communication when you're speaking in English? So it's a slightly different question. And in this case, 63% had a positive response, either most of the time or sometimes. And what was amazing to me is that 32% said they never thought about it which was weird. Um, so I like to think through the survey, we made them think about it. So Eric? So some of the insights that we have from the ESL speakers into how they modify their language or communication, they've discovered that 
when Americans say things like great to the rest of the world, that means good. So just like uh, Celsius and Fahrenheit, there is some unit conversion that has to be done. In some European and Asian countries, the style of communication can be more direct. And that can feel aggressive to American English speakers. Phonetics, although it can be helpful, it isn't always an accurate pronunciation. Not every word in the English language is pronounced phonetically. And I think us being in Massachusetts, if you look at a map, you can <laughs> see that not every Massachusetts city is pronounced phonetically. That comes from the British. Yeah. <laughs> Massachusetts itself is very difficult for, for us to say. Worcester. I mean, come on. Um, connotation is also something that's interesting, too, because understanding connotation can be difficult for ESL speakers, but it's, it's actually quite important because, for instance, even though the words inexpensive and cheap have the same definition, they can be interpreted very differently. Your new suit is inexpensive versus your new suit is cheap. Um, so it's difficult for, for ESL speakers to know that difference. One of the really interesting uh, comments that we got was practice thinking in English. And that was mind blowing for me because I practice thinking in English all the time, <laughs> but I was also, uh, that is my, my, my first and primary language. Um, so with more practice and experience thinking in English, you reduce that double translation that happens for, for ESL speakers. And I'll, I'll speak more about that in a little bit. Um, so some of the key insights. Uh, although both groups recommended simplification of language, simplifying your message is kind of like a lossy compression. You will lose data. Obviously, practicing uh, uh, technical communication directly applies to software development. But if you don't have conversational proficiency, you'll be limited in your ability to build relationships and rapport. And we all know that relationships and rapport with your community is, is quite important. Raising virtual hands in, in a meeting can help reduce interruptions. It acts as a mechanism to queue up folks that want to speak, as opposed to when they see that opening, they just jump in and potentially trample over somebody that was just about to say something. Whether the speaker asks the listener to, um, to paraphrase or the listener proactively paraphrases, this is often a good technique that will help both parties confirm understanding of the key points. And since many ESL speakers may feel uncomfortable speaking in a group meeting, one-on-one -on -one follow ups can be a safe way to be heard. Cultural norms is really tricky because there are so many cultures across the world. Um, for instance, Japanese people, they don't want to lose face by saying the wrong thing. So they may not respond at all, or they may excessively think about what to say, which can be interpreted as silence. Now, New Yorkers, such as myself, can be uncomfortable with silence. So we will fill that silence. <laughs> uh, I was told that um, by one of my, my Italian colleagues that um, Italians think it's weird to speak tentatively without direct or strong opinions. He started picking up some Americanisms in, in his communication style. And people have told him that either he is weird or they think he has ulterior motives. Um, so for some of the native English speakers, we, we asked the question, is not being proficient in English a disadvantage in the open source community? And uh, about 66% of native English language speakers have indicated reduced fluency shouldn't disadvantage ESL speakers since code is code. But as Karen was talking about earlier, it's more than just the code. Even though the, pro the programming languages are English-centric, 
uh, as is a lot of the peripheral work around the actual code itself. So the issue tracking, the comments, the documentation, pull request comments, explanations, those are often in English. So if you aren't completely comfortable with English, all of these activities can be micro impediments that eventually add up. Now, if English speakers don't realize these micro impediments, they may underestimate the culmination of all these impediments that have on the person doing the development work. Uh, now, we also asked ESL speakers, do you believe that your career has been slowed because of your English skills? 72% of the ESL speakers said they do not believe their career was slowed due to their English skills. With 28% of the ESL speakers saying their career has been impacted, the comments that we have received from the ESL folks, these ESL speakers that say their career has been in impacted, um, indicate to us that there is this hidden tax. So it takes more brain cycles to be constantly doing this translation, wordsmithing, um, and those extra cycles take away from doing the actual technical work, let alone any capacity to socialize with, with, your, with your colleagues. Adjusting your personality or behavior can be tiring or make you feel less comfortable participating in conversation or debate. Conversely, that can make others feel less confident in their capabilities because they are less vocal or they're providing confusing explanations. There also may be bias towards more fluent English speakers since they are easier to quote, easier, <clears throat> excuse me, easier to understand. And even when you only have ESL speakers in the room, sometimes it's harder for them to understand each other because of accents. So this goes back to the, they might gravitate to the uh, speakers that are more fluent in, in English. Um, it can also be harder or slower to persuade other, others of their ideas, especially when the explanation is simplified and lossy. So going back to the 72% of the ESL speakers that didn't believe their career was impacted, it would actually be quite easy to see them running into some of these types of issues. So maybe their career wasn't impacted, or maybe they didn't realize it was being impacted, or maybe they just accepted it as the cost of doing business. OK, so another really interesting question we asked was about um, their comfort level with English, doing different types of activities. So things like email and chat, video calls, uh, presenting, writing blogs, and then contributing, actually contributing to a project. So the ESL folks are on the right side there. Um, they were most comfortable with email, chat, which is on the left side, and then contributing on the right side, pretty much the same as the native English speakers, is you know, how they answer the survey. You'll see that the two in the middle, presenting and writing blogs, they scored much lower. Um, yeah, the ESL speakers scored much lower. Now, in general, everybody is less comfortable presenting <laughs> in front of people, but we found the ESL speakers were less so. So the ESL speakers have higher levels of comfort with short form written communications, as Carolyn was saying, such as email, chat, or even, even code, although code really isn't that short a form. Uh, this matches the techniques that they use to modify their communication style. Short, more direct replies. Now, there have been comments about discomfort with written stylistic or prose for ESL speakers, and that likely contributes with the discomfort for writing blogs. But since both groups have less comfort writing blogs, that could be a you know, lower stress form of communication where one can distinguish themselves or build reputation as a thought leader. And we can discuss a little bit more uh, about 
some uh, ways to help with that. ESL speakers have less comfort than native English speakers in communicating in real-time verbal communication, such as calls or presentation. Uh, with less comfort, there would be a reduced desire to participate. Those activities may be considered a higher stress form of communication, which are perceived to require faster reaction times. OK, so the last section is about the recommendations for ESL and native English speakers. And this is courtesy of the core platforms group at Red Hat and Eric and myself. Go ahead, Eric. Participating in safe activities or groups, such as Toastmasters, can be a good form of practice. So the more you practice, of course, in general, the better you will, you will become. Formal Engl English classes is another way to improve. Increasing your vocabulary will make your conversations more versatile. There is the very uncomfortable action of reviewing a recording of yourself speaking in a meeting or a presentation, and that can help you identify areas to improve. Consuming media, whether it be movies, videos, books, whatever form of entertainment that you enjoy can be a fun and productive way to improve if you're consuming that in English. Mentoring programs that are designed to specifically help you with pronunciation, phrasing in a private and safe environment. Now, in our comments, a person that spoke Australian English said, in the manner in which he has to modify his communication style, it doesn't reflect his identity well. And one would think, oh, hey, they speak English. But as, as I said, as um, people have varying levels of skills with regard to English, or at least their confidence around that. Find ways to fully immerse yourself in English is another uh, recommendation that we heard. And uh, using technology such, such as AI, and we'll talk about that right now. If you notice, there is an Instruct Lab booth out there, so. <laughs> uh, artificial intelligence should be viewed as a supplement. If you don't have the fundamentals, AI won't save you. Don't use the AI as a definitive source for your communications. Embrace typical language tools like spelling, grammar check, dictionaries, thesaurus. Um, use that at your disposal to improve your communications. As I said earlier, phonics is not foolproof. Use online translators or pronunciation tools. Whenever I'm in meetings, I always turn closed captions on. It supplements what I'm hearing, or it takes the place of something that I may have missed. Use whatever your favorite app to teach you English. You can also use text to voice for pronunciation. And um, using headphones. So background noise can reduce intelligibility, especially when you may already be having difficulty understanding. A good pair of headphones will help reduce background noise. So it's great that um, the Force is Yoda's ally. But since uh, most of us aren't Jedis, we actually need people allies. People will often have to translate English to their primary language, think about a response, then translate back to a simplified English response. That takes time. Give ESL speakers the time to do that. Some folks may be hesitant to participate in real-time conversations to begin with. So encouragement in participation and solicitation of their ideas can help them uh, feel comfortable to participate. I talked about mentorship earlier. You could be a mentor to help improve someone's confidence and capability. 
But also remember, there are less resources for technical English. So don't strictly focus on conversational English. Because people may be simplifying their communications, you may have to read between the lines or interpret what they are saying. And then, you know, as I, I, as I said earlier, confirm uh, what, you have, uh, what you have discussed by asking questions. Always assume good intentions because different cultures have different styles of communication, which may be perceived as rude in some written, in some English speaking cultures. By shifting communications to written forms or using it as a supplement, it provides a more comfortable space. You can do things like pre-publish agenda docs, take meeting notes, and use mm. written collaboration docs while in the meeting, which can be greatly helpful for ESL speakers. And um, that about sums it up. Yeah, I think we have some time for questions. If you have um, any questions, please raise your hand. We'll get the mic over. Karen? Hi. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, my question is more for um, from the perspective of like a maintainer on a project that's like a large open source project. And say it spans you know multiple countries and multiple companies and everything where we're not just jumping on video calls and all that. Right. Is there a, any suggestions or, or any um, like actionable things we can do as well to kind of help in that space? I mean, I, I, I see like the recommendations about improving English. I think those are good, but it's tough to like tell a drive-by patch contributor like uh, get good at English, man. You know, <laughs> like how can we, like right. is there something we can do? Right, so as you know, we're both managers. Um, I, I would ask other upstream maintainers to think about this question and ask their advice. So get a mentor to help you with that is my, my suggestion. Eric, anything else? Uh, so I think also for native English speakers that are trying to help ESL speakers, um, ask, ask them in private. Mm. Um, we, don't, we don't read minds because we're not all Jedis. Uh, and the easiest thing to do is to ask. Don't, don't make assumptions. See what, they, see what they, they think and do it in a safe way. Um, conversations. If you, right, if you need the name of a um, upstream maintainer who, for whom English is not their first language, or if English is their first language, either one. I mean, I know plenty, <laughs> as you do. Question? When did you have a question? Uh, yes. Oh, can we get the right here? Uh, it's a great survey and uh, great presentations. Thank you. Uh, I was asking, uh, have you ever think about to publish the results somewhere or publish as a paper for the ESL sp uh, speaker? Uh, that would be great because some of the recommendations I actually deployed. I deployed Grammarly. Uh, on my Google Chrome, and uh, I attended the, I attended the uh, Talk Toastmaster, I think, but not very recently. I was taking English lessons, and uh, it was really helpful. Uh, also, previously mentioned that you were using the closed captioning in a meeting. Is it really useful? You think? Uh, even for me, yes. Oh, okay. Def definitely. Well, what if, let's say. Uh, some other participants are not the native speakers. They might have an accent. Because mm -hmm. then the, the translation might be wrong. You know what uh, I mean? Sometimes the translation is very wrong <laughs> and uh, maybe mildly humorous to, say, a fourth <laughs> grader. Yeah. Um, and uh, sometimes it actually translates, uh, sometimes it transcribes things that I didn't catch. Uh -huh. mm. uh, where I'm like, I didn't hear, I, I don't understand what they said. I look at the closed captions like, oh, yes, OK. Okay. They said that. We've had recommendations from many different types of groups asking for closed captioning in, in all meetings. You know, something to think about, it's, it's technology. It's, it's a tool. It can help. But because it's technology, and sometimes technology doesn't do the right thing, you have to keep that in mind. So use, use at, uh, at your own discretion. 
I also think it's getting better over time. Uh, another comment about closed captioning or, or the translation. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you've tried this yet, but record yourself speaking with the closed caption turned on, and then you can see if it understood you, right? It got your words right. Mm -hmm. I think this is good even for native English speakers because we may not enunciate well, and it just watch what it mis how it mistranslates or mis, you know. I wish you told me that yesterday. I would have put that in the tips. That's a good one. Yeah. How you practiced and uh, yeah. And as far as publishing the survey, it's now on DevConf. Oh. I forgot to mention that I put the slides in the DevConf website, so you can have a copy of the slides. Um, because you're Red Hat, you can. We can probably give you access to all the data. There's tons of data in the survey that we didn't have a chance to mine. Mm -hmm. It's really fascinating. Yes, thanks, thanks. Yeah. I'll, I'll definitely try out the closed captioning next time in the meeting. Yeah, thanks. Good. Any other questions? Hey, thanks, thanks everyone for, for that meeting, for that talk. Um, we talked a little bit about that uh, uh, for preparation for that meeting too, right? Um, I just wanna maybe point out if to any AI developers here, uh, that closed captioning is, is cool, I guess it's, the, it's in the right direction, but there's a lot of, uh, and, and I guess you guys mentioned that during the talk too, there's a lot of nuance in, in the communication, uh, a lot of uh, cultural references mm. and, and a lot of nuance in how the communication is going. So for those who are anime fans, <laughs> The next level of actually uh, uh, subtitles is actually contextualizing the subtitles. So I mean, if there's any AI developer out there, I mean, I guess the next, I mean, frontier would be for actually the, uh, the the closed captioner, right, to be able to flag when there is irony being used. And sometimes ah. we don't, we never, we never get that when there are cultural references being used. When there are, I mean, um, uh, local, even I mean, local things being referenced to. Um, I find myself, I mean, here when I'm visiting US, the, 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 the most difficult thing that I have is uh, ordering food. <laughs> really? Yeah, because I mean, uh, we, we know the technical, um, it's part of our day to day to know the technical jargon. Yep. But you guys, you guys, American, you came up with new names for, for food, <laughs> I mean, like crazy. <laughs> Right, I mean, I, we, we cannot we cannot keep up with 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 all the names for, and, and then it becomes the norm, right? I mean, you need to know what a sweetie way is, right? I, I don't know what that is, right? I mean, so so that uh, I guess would be a good thing for any any AI developers to be paying attention to. Give us the context mm. too, or mm. I mean, uh, help us with with contextualizing that too. When you when you are bringing up irony, when you're bringing up local references, this this is uh, helpful as well. So. Not a question, sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. We'll take comments and helping each other is part of open and community. Yeah. Uh, Yash in the back. Thanks, uh, Karen, Eric. So, as an ESL speaker, some advice we all heard at the keynote in the morning was being authentic and being yourself, right? Like mm -hmm. show up as your true self. So for open source developers who maybe don't work from North America, they are in their home country where maybe English is not spoken and they will have an accent, they will have certain usage of English. So how do we balance that? Because I think a lot of the recommendations for uh, allyship or you know being for ESL speakers was to practice English. Mm. Uh, better, but if you're doing it from your home country, you'll always have that. So how do you balance being authentic and? I noticed that in Kelsey's talk this morning too. I, I really don't have a good answer for that. What, I'd, what I will say though, is that as somebody who's more in the ally position, it's really interesting trying to learn somebody else's language. Um, like I said, I was in that situation in Beijing. I was also in Japan where there was simultaneous translation going on. It was really interesting. I have so much respect for your, you folks who speak multiple languages. I cannot say I'm proficient in any other language. And in fact, I feel inferior because my English is not great. But actually, that works well with open source where people simplify my language. I, I'm being myself talking in simple English, right? 
Um, that, that's a really good question. Do you have any insights, Eric? Um, yeah, you know, it's kind of a two-pronged approach. On one end, uh, as an ESL speaker, practice getting better, using some of the tips and techniques. Um, and then on the other end, there's the allyship. If you're not, if you are in a community that you don't feel comfortable with, you're, you're not gonna become better. Um, you may actually withdraw. So it's really important to have that two-pronged approach. And that's why we, we talk about both for ESL speakers as well as for allies. Well, here's another one I thought of. And that is um, realizing part of it is up to me to listen better to people's accents. I'll have to say the, the hardest person to listen to was a Spanish, native Spanish speaker speaking English. But I feel like it, it goes both ways. He needs, he needs to pronounce his English words better, but I also have to be a better listener and not be afraid to interrupt him when I can't understand something and ask. Okay, um, I, I think- Do we have time for one more? I think we're actually nope. out of time. Oh, out of time. Um, but as we're cleaning up, we can, you know, if you folks want to come up and- more Yep, than happy we'll be to in try. the hallway too. We'll be around all week. Thank you. Thank you.